وَإِن تَعْجَبْ فَعَجَبُ قَوْلُهُمْ أَيْذَا كُنَّا تُرَابًا أَيْنَا لَفِي خَلْقٍ جَدِيدٍ أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ الْأَغْلَالُ فِي أَعْنَاقِهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أما بعد Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu and welcome to the first episode of season two of the Hot Seat Podcast. We've got a slightly different setup as you may see from your screen and that's because for the first time on the Hot Seat I'm joined by not just one but two very special guests. I welcome back to the Hot Seat the familiar face of Ustad Abdul Rahman Hassan and joining me for the first time is Ustad Tim Humble. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. How are you guys? Assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Ustad Tim, a special welcome to yourself, of course, the first time in the hot seat. It's a pleasure to be here. Jazakallah mm-hmm. khairan for coming. Um, we've got a very special, very interesting topic to discuss today. It's one of those topics that many people have an interest in because uh, it's related to the world of the unseen. So we want to do a, a two, a couple of episodes on this topic. Um, the first one is going to be covering the topic of the jinn. And the second one is going to be talking about magic and evil eye. Yeah. Um, these are things that you kind of hear growing up, you hear stories about these things, but what I really want to establish is that do these things have any legitimacy and proof in the religion of Islam, or are they just mere fables that have just been passed down from generation to generation? Mm. So we're going to be talking about the jinn today, and let me start with a very simple question. What exactly is a jinn? Okay. I think before we start to answer that question, you mentioned a very, very valid point and one that I think is really important for us to start, which is the discussion about the unseen. Uh, What we're talking about and and the question you posed about what are the jinn or who are the jinn is a question which relates to the unseen. And belief in the unseen is a fundamental part of the belief of a Muslim. And in fact, if we look at Surah Al-Baqarah, in which Allah Azza wa Jal says, "Alladina yu'minuna bil ghayb," right, the very beginning of the Quran, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala then says about those people who believe in the unseen, Allah Azza wa Jal said, "Ulaika ala hudam min Rabbihim, wa ulaika humul muflihun." So one of the characteristics of the people who are guided and the people who are successful are that they believe in the unseen, mm. and that means they believe in things that they can't see with their own eyes or they can't perceive with their senses but they believe in them because Allah Azza wa Jal and his messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us about them and also that just guessing about the unseen and you know sort of just randomly um, coming out with things and opinions and he said and she said is not also from the characteristics of the believer in Surah Al-Kahf Allah Azza wa Jal criticized the people who guessed regarding the number of the people in the cave and the, the, the dog that was with them. And he said, Rajaman bil ghayb. They were just randomly, you know, throwing things out there, just mm. trying to find, trying to guess the, the unseen. So it's really, really important to us as Muslims take our knowledge of the unseen from the Quran, from the Sunnah, and that we do so without guesses and without kind of um, sort of weird and wonderful theories, but we take it from, from the text itself. I believe that's extremely important. Okay. Do you have... Yeah, mashallah, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursaleen, sayyidina wa nabiyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa tabi'ina lahum bi ihsanin ila yawmi deen amma ba'd. Building on what uh, Sheikh Muhammad mentioned, the scholars, they state uh, in their books, and uh, Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah actually wrote a book on this issue, which is the reconcile between revelation and reasoning. Hmm. And he, rahimahullah, mentioned uh, and he's a student, Ibn al-Qayyim, in his kitab, Sawa'iq al-Mursala, that this issue of ilm al is from the things that a person can never uh, speak about it uh, except through textual evidence. Okay. This is where the aql doesn't have a say because he can't speak about it, hasn't seen it. And aql only works, which is uh, reasoning, only works in things that's empirical, things which you can observe and look at. Walidharik Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, says in a couple of lines of poetry, he says, لا يستقل العقل دون هداية بالوحي تفصيلا ولا تأصيلا كالطرف دون النور ليس بمدرك 
حتى يراه بكرة وأصيلا فإذا النبوة أما نور النبوة مثل نور الشمس للعين البصيرة فاتخذه دليلا In these lines Ibn al-Qayyim is pointing out that لا يستقل العقل دون هداية The aql cannot bring guidance to you individually by itself And we spoke about this in great details yeah, in our we previous uh, episode on the uh, uh, rev- revelation versus reasoning. One of the things that aql cannot talk about, and it's restricted, just like your eyesight is restricted, is because you can't see everything. Mm. And you can't, if you look at uh, somewhere, your eyesight will come back and not be able to see everything in front of it. The aql is also like that, it's restricted. And the things that the aql can't talk about, Ibn al-Qayyim mentions, is three things. I know he's student Ibn Taymiyyah as well. It is that... Number one, the aql cannot guide you independently. You can't come to guidance just by uh, using your aql. Number two is aql cannot uh, reconcile between two pe- two parties of people who are who have a conflict and are differing and disagreeing. And the third thing is aql cannot speak about the unseen. So we have to take all of these, the unseen, jinns, malaika, and things related to that, all from the Quran and the sunnah. Okay. And many tawa'if and groups became misguided because... They took their, uh, they spoke about the unseen based on uh, aql. Second thing I wanted to mention is that because uh, we're going to be talking about the issue of possession and jinn yes. entering the human the, the, the body, it's important that we believe in al qada wal qadr, khayrihi wa sharri, that which Allah wa Taala destined the good of it and the evil of it, um, and that's the one of the articles of uh, our iman. Uh, mm-hmm. Allah Tabarak, the Prophet Sallallahu said in the famous hadith of Jibreel, uh, when he was asked about Al-Iman, he said, أَن تُؤْمِنَ بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِي وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسُولِ وَلِيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَتُؤْمِنَ بِالْقَدَرِ خَيْرِ وَشَرِّ That you believe in the khair and the shar. And also Allah Tabarak Ta'ala, he says in the Quran, مَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنَّ بَرَاهَا إِنَّ ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ يَسِيرٍ So, meaning, sorry, the ayah. that you're not afflicted with a calamity. And you don't go through a hardship or anything, except that it was written. Qada and Qadr. Okay. It's all written. Allah wrote it, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the famous hadith, وَعَلَمْ أَنَّ مَا أَصَابَكَ لَمْ يَكُنْ لِيُخْطِئَكَ وَمَا أَخْطَأَكَ لَمْ يَكُنْ لِيُصِيبَكَ That what you've been afflicted with was never meant to miss you. Hmm. And what missed you was never meant to afflict you. And the hadith has a longer meaning, I mean, different wordings. But And the third thing that I, th- I wanted to add on to um, two things I wanted to add on what Sheikh mentioned is that patience when we're afflicted with these things to be very patient and imprison our nafs from speaking that which is is not permissible and that which is not allowed the Prophet Sallallahu he said in the hadith Ajab li amri al-mu'min fascination and wonder is in the affairs of the believer in asabatu sarra shakara fakana khayra Allah wa in asabatu darra sabra fakana khayra Allah that fascination is in the affairs of the believer. If he's afflicted with good, he shows gratitude. Mm. And if he's afflicted with hardship, hardship and harm and pain, he shows uh, patience. And that Ibn al-Qayyim, from that, he said that the slave, he tosses and he turns in those two situations in his life. He's either going through uh, a time of hardship, and what is required from him is maqam al-sabr. Uh, you go through hardship, the servitude that is required from you now is patience. Mm. And sometimes you're going through ease and happiness and joy. The servitude that is required from you here is gratitude. And Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala said, وَبَشِّرُ الصَّابِرِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتُهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَجْعُونَ The sign that you're a patient person is that when you talk, what comes out of your mouth is what, which is pleasing to Allah mm. after the calamity has fallen, befallen you. So I think that three points is a good introduction Jazakallah. before we define what a, uh, what jinns is. Sheikh. Uh, I, no, I only wanted to add to that on a, on the point that you made regarding reasoning and, and regarding the aql, mm. that here we're not just talking about the aql being the means by which you affirm something, but even also the means by which someone rejects something. Okay. Both of those could be valid. So mm. there are some people who might use their intellect to affirm something as existing. Because it makes sense to me. And others who might reject something because it makes sense to me. But ultimately that's not a valid uh, scale of balance by which we can measure things Islamically on either side. Whether affirming things or whether it comes to negating things. 
you asked me, uh, sorry, we went off on a tangent, but I did. I thought it was important. But yeah. on about regarding uh, a little bit of a definition or who or what are the jinn. So linguistically, Ibn Mandur in Lisan al Arab, he mentioned regarding this word jinn. And he said, He said this word, Jannah, it means to cover something or to conceal something. And he said, Anything which is concealed from you can be referred to with this jim and the noon and the noon, this jinn. And he said later on, And because of this linguistic reason, the jinn are called the jinn because they are covered and right. hidden and concealed. So that's the sort of linguistic basis. In terms of a, a shara'i definition, I'm not going through the statements of the scholars. You know when the scholars are trying to bring ta'rifat, they try and bring definitions for mm -hmm. things. There's always this aim for it to be jami' and mani' to be comprehensive and exclusive and and it's, a, it's not an easy thing to bring out definitions for things. But I thought we could take it from a, a different way, which would be a nice way of introducing the topic, is to take it from, let's say, sort of five passages in the Qur'an that define for us the jinn. So the first one is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jalla in Surah Al-Hijr, وَالْجَانَّ خَلَقَنَاهُ مِنْ قَبْلُ مِنْ نَارِ السَّمُونَ The jinn, we created them before, i.e. before mankind, mm -hmm. from Nar samum from this uh, smokeless fire. So we know that from this, that they are a creation from the creation of Allah Azza wa and that they were created prior to the creation of mankind. That's one part of the definition. Now if we look at Surah Al-Ahqaf, when Allah Azza wa said, وَإِذْ صَرَفْنَا إِلَيْكَ نَفَرًا مِنَ الْجِنِّ يَسْتَمِعُونَ الْقُرْآنِ فَلَمَّا حَضَرُوهُ قَالُوا أَنْصِتُوا فَلَمَّا قُضِيَ وَلَّوْا إِلَى قَوْمِهِمْ مُنْذِرِينَ قالوا يا قومنا إن سمعنا كتابا أنزل من بعد موسى مصدقا لما بين يدي يهدي إلى الحق وإلى طريق مستقيم يا قومنا أجيبوا داعي الله وآمن به يغفر لكم من ذنوبكم ويجركم من عذاب أليم. Here, when Allah Azza wa Jalla tells the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when a group of the jinn were directed to him and they listened to the Quran and when they attended it. They said to each other, be silent. Mm -hmm. And when it was finished, the recitation, they went back to their people as warners. They said, our people, we have heard a book revealed after Musa, which gives truth to that which came before it. It guides to the truth and to a straight path. Our people, answer the caller of Allah and believe in him. You will be forgiven for your sins and you will be saved from a painful torment. From this, we can take out certain important definitions that relating to the jinn, that they have an intellect, mm -hmm. that they have an aql, yeah. because they are commanded to answer and they are told to listen and they understand the Quran that is recited to them. So they are, they have an aql, they have an irada, they have a will, a choice, because they are told ajib or answer. So they have a choice to answer or not to answer, and they are commanded to follow the commands of Allah in a similar way to that of human beings. Okay. We can also uh, take from the ayah in Surah Al-A'raf, that they are a creation that is hidden from our sight under normal uh, circumstances. Okay. And then we can also take from Surah Al-Jinn, وَأَنَّا مِنَّا الْمُسْلِمُونَ وَمِنَّا الْقَاسِطُونَ فَمَنْ أَسْلَمَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ تَحَرَّوا رَشَدًا وَأَمَّا الْقَاسِطُونَ فَكَانُوا لِجَهَنَّمَ حَطَبًا That among us are Muslims and among us are others who are disbelievers or defiantly disobedient and whoever accepts Islam then those are the people who have taken the right way and as for those disbelievers they will be firewood for Jahannam we can take from this that among them are Muslims and among them are disbelievers. Mm -hmm. And finally, from the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, uh, and this hadith narrated in Sahih Muslim, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi said, خُلِقَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ مِن نُور وَخُلِقَ الْجَانُّ مِن مَارِجٍ مِن نَار وَخُلِقَ آدَمُ مِمَّا وُصِفَ لَكُمْ أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم, that he said that the angels were created from light and that the jinn were created from the smokers' flame of fire and that Adam was created from what has been described to you, that the jinn are distinct from the angels and from mm. human beings. I think that okay. probably covers, inshallah, I don't know if you have extra points, that more or covers most of the issues relating to the technical definition of the jinn. Now, as the Sheikh mentioned, the word jinn, originally the root word, this jim and the noon, and the Arabs, they say it means, it means a satr, 
something that's covered and it's hidden. لذلك, that's why the person who's insane is called Majnoon mm. because his aql is being covered. Okay. Um, the Jannah that we enter is the same root word. Yeah. And they said the word Jannah is, is used because of the jinn and the noon is because there are many trees around it which hide from you what's inside. Right. And that's why it's used. So that root, even the, the mother's womb is also, they use the ajinnatun fi butun ummahatikum. So the word has that meaning which is hidden. And mm-hmm. Sheikh mentioned the ayah, Ya Bani Adam la yaftinannakum ash-shaytanu kama akhraja abawaykum min al-jannati yanzi'u 'anhuma libasahuma liyuriyahu ma sawatihim innahu yarakum huwa wa qabilu min haythu la tarawnahum inna ja'alna ash-shayatina awliya' lil-ladhina la yu'minun. So they can see you when you can't see them. What is that? There's a fa'ida I came across which Ibn al-Qayyim mentions that we seek refuge in Allah tabarak wa ta'ala from the angels because they are a creation we can't see and we seek refuge in the one they can't see mm. which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also the jinn uh, they were created before us they they came into existence before we came Allah tabarak wa ta'ala he says that we created the jinn before uh, the children of Adam mm-hmm. came and the hadith of Aisha that the prophet sallallahu said khuliqat al jinn khuliqat al malaikatu min nur وخلقت الجان من نار من نار السموم وخلقت وخلقت وخلق ادم مما وصف لكم that the jinn is uh, made from the smokeless fire and some scholars they discussed the uh, the issue of is the jinn uh, from iblis is that is that who yeah. they come from because we came from adam عليه السلام mm. and he's our father did he they come from the shaytan iblis and that which seems apparent from the quran is that he's in, he's not the the their father that they all come from and the ayah wid qulna lil malaikati sujudu li adam fa sajadu illa iblisa kana min al jinn fa fasaqa an amri rabbih which means that j- what i want from the ayah is that iblis is from them that's what the ayah says uh, iblis is min al jinn he's from the jinn the word min here is tabridiyah means he's from the jinn and Allah also tells in the ayah ويدخلنا الملائكة يسجدوا لآدم فسجدوا فسجدوا إلا إبليس كان من الجن ففسق عن أمر ربي أفت تتخذونه وذريته أولياء من دوني وهم لكم عدو بئس للظالمين بدلا that he has children offspring so they have they get married have children they also amongst them are Muslims and non Muslims and amongst them are righteous Muslims and criminals وأن من المسلمون ومن القاسطون فمن أسلم فأولئك تحروا رشدا وأن من الصالحون ومن دون ذلك كنا طرائق قددا. They also amongst them are dimwitted one. وأنه كان يقول سفي هنا على الله شططا. Amongst them are those who listen to the Quran. وإذ صرفنا إليك نفر من الجن يستمعون القرآن فلما حضروه قالوا أنصتوا فلما قضي ولوا إلى قوم منذرين قالوا يا قومنا إن سمعنا كتابا أنزل من بعد موسى مصدقا لما بين يديه هدي إلى الحق وإلى طريق مستقيم يا قومنا أجيبوا داعي الله فأمنوا به يغفر لكم من ذنوبكم ويجيركم من عذاب أليم So they're not only listening to the Quran and pondering over it and contemplating but they are دعات إلى الله They go and they do da'wah So they spread the message of uh, Islam so this is a comprehensive yeah. There's three things like that the jinns have Which is why they were mukallaf the Meaning why they were burdened And they were requested to worship Allah wa ta'ala. Because Allah said in the Quran wa ma jinna wal insa illa, illa li And in another ayah Allah says Ya ma'ashara al-jinni wal insi Alam ya'tikum rusulu minkum Yaqussuna alaykum ayati Wa yunzirunakum liqa'a yawmikum hadha Qalu shahidna ala anfusina Wa gharratumu al-hayatu dunya Wa shahidu ala anfusima Nam kanu kafirin so they're be, they're being summary of the ayah just meaning they're being questioned and interrogated day of judgment being asked uh, you know did not a messenger come to you right. were you not there was, there was were you not warned so they're mukallaf based on those two ayahs and the scholars they say they're mukallaf because three things are present in them the sheikh mentioned it they have qudra ability uh, so they have ability they have irada meaning they have a will and they also have Qudra, uh, did I mention ability? Naam, they have Qudra, ability, they have Irada, and they have Al-Aql. Mm. So they can think, they see things, they 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 know what they're doing. And this has now made them Mukallaf. Uh, and last point I want to mention, inshallah ta'ala, is that the jinns are actually considered to be lower than the Bani Adam. Okay. They're ranked lower than it. What's the proof of that? And the evidence that the scholars mention is Qawluhu ta'ala, the statement of Allah, 
ولقد كرمنا بني ادم we honored the children of adam so this is that we honored then the jinn and another ayah clearly shows that وانه كان رجال من الانس يعوذون برجال من الجن فزادوهم رهقا that the jinns originally used to respect us and they used to look up to us and we were great in their eyes until a group of um, uh, a group of jinns mm. uh, I mean a group of humans uh, went and seeked uh, refuge and help from the jinn and once okay. they did that Allah says فزادوهم رهقا now this made them feel that they mean something they, what they, they have some value and some worth so all these ayat and these hadiths really established not only the meaning of what a jinn is Mm. But it also proves that the jinns actually do exist. There are jinns. A creation out there referred to as jinn. It's mentioned in the Quran. And something a Muslim who believes in Allah under their judgment can, cannot reject, to be honest. For sure. I think that's a really comprehensive um, summary of, of who the jinn are and what, what, um, some of their attributes. Um, just before we move on, I do want to mention something that you, you mentioned, Ustaz Uthman. You mentioned the ayah where in the Quran it clearly states that shaitan, Iblis, is from the jinn. There's often a bit of confusion here and there's um, some people who believe that he's actually a fallen angel, for example. Mm-hmm. And the reason they believe that is because at the start of the ayah, Allah addresses the angels. When we said to the angels, Ustudu li Adam, prostrate to Adam. So it almost seems like Iblis here is being included within the angels. So I said to him, is there any possibility that maybe the word jinn used in this ayah for shaitan is a linguistic definition, meaning he's hidden, mm. just like the rest of the angels are hidden from us, and that he's actually an angel? So there's a lot of a lot of ways that we can differentiate between the jinn and the angels. One that we mentioned before is in the hadith of Aisha, radiallahu anha, we said it in Sahih Muslim, in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke about three different categories. The angels created from light, the jinn created from the smokeless fire, and Adam created from what's been described to you. So okay. that first of all, gives us a distinction. But I've got another, a, a couple of things to think about. First of all, the angels themselves differentiate. Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَيَوْمَ يَحْشُرُهُمْ جَمِيعًا ثُمَّ يَقُولُ, ثم يقول لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ أَحَا أُولَاءِ إِيَّاكُمْ كَانُوا يَعْبُدُونَ قَالُوا سُبْحَانَكَ أَنْتَ وَلِيُّنَا مِنْ دُونِهِمْ بَلْ كَانُوا يَعْبُدُونَ الْجِنْ أَكْثَرُهُمْ بِهِمْ مُؤْمِنُونَ on the day when he will gather them all together and will say to the angels, was it you that these people used to worship? The angels will say, exalted are you in perfection. You are our wali rather than them. They used to worship the jinn. Most of them were believers in the jinn, not in the angels. So the angels themselves differentiate. The fact that the jinn have children, she already mentioned the ayah in Surah al Awliya, do you take him and his offspring as awliya? And the fact that Allah Azza wa Jalla said, وَلَقَدْ ذَرَأْنَا لِجَهَنَّمَ كَثِيرًا مِنَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنسِ We have prepared Jahannam for many of the jinn and the ins. And again, that's not true of the angels, the angels not disobeying Allah mm-hmm. Azza wa Jal, uh, and so on. Mm-hmm. So here we have uh, many, many evidences. And we also have something else that we can look at, which is that generally, when we in Arabic, when we use an exception, we mm-hmm. make an ex- or we make. So, for example, we were to say, use the word "accept" in English. In Arabic, we, we could use "illa." There are other ways we could use it as well. And we say "illa," accept. In Arabic, there is something which is when you make an exception, mm-hmm. and that exception doesn't come from the original thing that you're speaking about. And this is uh, called al-mustathna al-munqati' A broken exception An exception that is broken off from the thing that you're originally talking about mm-hmm. So in Arabic it's perfectly common to say something like All of the students left except the teacher All of the players left except the fans The examples of this in the Arabic language are very, very frequent It's a very common usage of Arabic So when we put all these things together Kana min al-jinn And we see the differences between the angels and the jinn We see the hadith of Aisha And we see the existence in Arabic of having an exception which doesn't come from the original thing that you're talking about, it becomes quite clear that the angels here are not uh, the jinn and the jinn are not the angels. Okay. And Iblis falls into which camp? It's quite clear because of the direct text that he falls Can into the camp jinn. He was from among the jinn. And if the fact that he has offspring and so on, we mentioned, making him different. The fact that he was among the angels, that he was honored to be able to spend among the angels, indicate that he was covered by that command where the angels were told to prostrate that he among them was included in that command okay. and yet for Fasaqa 
عن أمر ربي. He disobeyed and defied the command of his Lord. Okay. Even Subhanallah, um, when you look at the uh, um, ulama, they mention that the humans are stationed in the middle. When a human, they say, some of the scholars, that when this human you know, follows Allah's commandments and listens to what Allah tells him to do, he has now taken a level at the station of the angels. Mm. And so, but when they, which is قوله تعالى يا الذين آمنوا قو أنفسكم وأهليكم نارا وقودها الناس والحجارة عليها ملائكة غلاظ شداد لا يعصون الله ما أمرهم ويفعلون ما يؤمرون. Even another ayah Allah سبحانه وتعالى says يسبحون الليل والنهار لا يفطرون. Allah when he talks about the angels he mentions that they are very obedient so this is a trait that you've taken on mm. and so then you are with them but then when the slave becomes very you know bad and evil and he does they say he goes even below the animal and so this trait that I mean this uh, thing which is Iblis being with the angels they said that it was because of his righteous actions okay. and his good doings and it's not just unique for him. They say, the ulama say, this is something even the believer can receive. Like, mm. not literally be with them now, but be of that station. That you are a person who's obeying and listening to Allah. Okay, um, I now want to move the discussion onto the main main topic, which is, what is the extent that the jinn can interact with the humans? So the, the, the concept that the jinn can interact with human beings is one that is well established uh, within the Quran. And particularly, just to take a general sense, because here I, I don't want to necessarily, uh, I don't want to necessarily go into the topic of possession at this moment in time. Yeah. Just to talk about generally the interaction. In Surah Al-An'am, Allah Azawajal said, وَيَوْمَ يَحْشُرُهُمْ جَمِيعًا يَا مَعْشَرَ الْجِنِّ قَدْ اسْتَكْثَرْتُمْ مِنَ الْإِنسِ وَقَالَ أَوْلِيَاؤُهُمْ مِنَ الْإِنسِ رَبَّنَا اسْتَمْتَعَ بَعْضُنَا بِبَعْض وَبَلَغْنَا أَجَلَنَا الَّذِي أَجَّلْتَ لَنَا Until the end of the ayah. Allah Azza wa Jal said, on the day when he will gather them all together and say, O group of jinn, you have istakthartum, you have really frequently, you have frequently uh, frequented mankind. You know, it's something you frequent interaction with mankind, frequently misguided them, frequent, you have this, you know, constant interaction with mankind. But their allies from among the men will say, Our Lord, We, each of us, took advantage of the other. Mm. Each of us took something from the other. And we have reached this appointed time that you have appointed for us. Allah will say, The fire is your abode until the end of the eye. So here we see clearly that there were men that sought a benefit and sought to take advantage of the jinn and there were jinn that sought to take advantage of men and so this interaction exists and in fact this interaction particular interaction between the shaitan and between bani adam is something which is mentioned in so many places in the quran mm -hmm. but this is just a, a really clear example of how each one is interacting interacting with the other also the ayah the famous And said to the jinn, you know, help us, do this for us. And this is when the jinns then became arrogant and full of themselves mm. and started to realize, oh, okay, we mm. actually are valuable. The humans need us. And also the sheikh state the ayah that he brought, um, some of the scholars actually use that ayah to say that the jinn and the ins can actually get married. Mm. Uh, because the ayah is timta'm can involve marriage. And many ulama have stated that um, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, Ibn Hajar al-Haytami rahimahullah, and many other great scholars. Some have actually even transmitted a consensus that this can happen. Like ala kulli hal, the interaction between humans and jinn can be of good interaction and it can also be of evil interaction. Mm -hmm. The example of a good interaction is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, there is not a person except that he has a qareen. And this qareen, you know, whispers to the person, and that the you know to do evil to go against Allah's command to do this and that, and also the, then the Sahaba said, "Ya Rasulullah, even you," mm -hmm. and he said, "Even me." But ex even so, he said, "As for me, sorry, Allah Tabarak wa Taala aided me from him, and he took Islam, and he doesn't command me except that which is good." Mm, I see. So that's another interaction. Also, another interaction is 
uh, an interaction that is unique to Nabi Lahi Sulaiman that he had with the jinns. Nabi Lahi Sulaiman, Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, he gave him wa hushira li Sulaiman junuduhu min al-jinni wal insi wa tayri fuhum yuza'un. Sulaiman had king, he had this world, Allah gave it to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah mentions in the Quran, subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَلَقَدْ أَتَيْنَا دَاوُدَ مِنَّا فَضْلًا يَا جِبَالُ أَوِّبِي مَعَهُ وَطَيْرَ وَأَلَنَّا لَهُ الْحَدِيدِ أَنِ اعْمَلْ صَابِغَاتٍ وَقَدِّرْ فِي الصَّدِّ وَعْمَلُوا صَالِحًا إِنِّي بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بَصِيرٌ وَلِسُلَيْمَانَ الرِّيحَ غُدُوهَا شَهْرٌ وَرَوَاحُهَا شَهْرٌ وَأَسَلْنَا لَهُ عَيْنَ القطر ومن الجن من يعمل بين يديه بإذن ربه ومن يزيغ منهم عن أمرنا نذقه من عذاب السعير يعملون له ما يشاء من محاريب وتماثيل وجفان كالجواب وقدور الراسيات اعملوا آل داود شكرا وقليل من عبادي الشكور فلما قضينا عليه الموت ما دلهم على موت إلى آخر الآيات الله تقول نبي الله سليمان they used to work for him to an extent a high level that they used to even وَالشَّيَاطِينَ كُلَّ بَنَّاءِ وَغَوَّاسِ Some of them used to build constructions for him and some of them used to go into the ocean and get mm. jewels and gems from the earth from him, for him. And he also was able to punish them. Rahimahullah um, ta'ala, alayhi salam. He was able to punish those who would go against his command uh, and make them suffer because of their wrongdoings. So there was that interaction that Sulaiman had okay. and inter, you know, dealings okay. that Allah gave him. On the topic Sheikh mentioned, actually, we, we've twice come to this ayah in Surah Al-Jinn. وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ رِجَالٌ مِنَ الْإِنسِ يَعُوذُونَ بِرِجَالٍ مِنَ الْجِنِّ فَزَادُوهُمْ رَهَقًا I'm going to quote you from Ikrimah, رَحِمَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى And that he said, كَانَ الْجِنُّ يَفْرَقُونَ مِنَ الْإِنسِ كَمَا يَفْرَقُ الْإِنسُ مِنْهُمْ أَوْ أَشَدْ The jinn used to run away or used to be scared of men. Like men are scared of them or even worse. وَكَانَ الْإِنسُ إِذَا نَزَلُوا وَادِيًا هَرَبَ الْجِنْ And when the men would come to a valley, the jinn would run away. فَيَقُولُ سَيِّدُ الْقَوْمِ The leader of those men, he would say, نَعُوذُ بِسَيِّدِ أَهْلِ هَذِ الْوَادِ He said, we seek refuge with the, with the master of the people in this valley. فَقَالَ الْجِنْ نَرَاهُمْ يَفْرَقُونَ مِنَّا كَمَا نَفْرَقُ مِنْهُمْ They said, we see these people are scared of us like we're scared of them. فَدَنَوْ مِنَ الْإِنسِ فَأَصَابُوهُمْ بِالْخَبَرِ وَالْجُنُونِ And they came close to men and then they became, they made them become insane and they suffered, they made them suffer madness and insanity. And then he said, فَذَلِكَ قَوْلُ اللَّهِ This is the statement of Allah وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ رِجَالٌ مِنَ الْإِنسِ يَعُوذُونَ بِرِجَالٍ مِنَ الْجِنِ فَزَادُوهُمْ رَهَقَ And this was narrated by Ibn Abi Hatim in his tafsir from Ikrima. So this is just an example of how this ayah indicates that interaction and you mm. see that interaction between the men and the jinn in, in, even in this ayah. Okay, let's talk about a specific part of that interaction, that's namely jinn possession, where the majority of the rest of the episode is going to revolve around. Is it possible for a jinn to possess a human being? Mm. Allah Azza wa Jal said in Surah Al-Baqarah, الَّذِينَ يَأْكُلُونَ الرِّبَا لَا يَقُومُونَ إِلَّا كَمَا يَقُومُ الَّذِي يَتَخَبَّطُهُ الشَّيْطَانُ مِنَ الْمَسِ Those who devour riba will not stand except like the one who has يَتَخَبَّطُهُ الشَّيْطَانُ تَخَبُّط The shaytan has caused him to become insane because of al-mas. Now, whenever we look at an ayah, of course, we look at the tafsir and we look at the tafsir of the early generations. I just would like to quote you only from tafsir al-Tabari to start with. Okay. So Imam al-Tabari, we know he died 310 years after the Hijrah. And he's quoting from the people before that. He said, لا يقومون في الآخرة من قبورهم They will not stand in the hereafter from their graves. And then he said, يتخبطه الشيطان يَتَخَبَّلُهُ الشَّيْطَانِ فِي الدُّنْيَا The shaytan causes him to become insane in the dunya. وَهُوَ الَّذِي, يخ... وهو الذي يَخْنُقُهُ فَيَسْرَعُهُ he... فَيَسْرَعُهُ He is the one who strangles that person and makes them uh, suffer from a fit, makes them faint mm. uh, because of الْمَسْعَ يَعْنِي مِنَ الْجُنُونَ Because of insanity. Then he quotes from Ibn Abbas that Ibn Abbas said that the person who ba- uh, that he, Ibn Abbas said that uh, akhir riba that the person who will devour riba will be will be resurrected yawm al-qiyamah majnoon majnoonan 
يخنق, that he will be insane and he will be like he has been pressured or strangled from the shaitan. And from Qatada, that he said, It's the insanity that the shaitan makes the person uh, go insane. And he quoted from many, many others. Uh, in fact, he didn't, uh, Tabari, rahimahullah ta'ala, didn't mention any other opinion for this ayah okay. except that. That this ayah refers to the shaitan in the dunya making a person suffer insanity and epileptic fits, sarak, making them faint and causing them to become insane. Yeah, I suppose, um, so what we spoke at the beginning about aql and how um, it can, um, you can't be used when you can't see things. But I can see things in the dunya and I do see a lot of people taking riba, being involved in interests. It's very widespread. And they don't stand like as if they're insane or anything like that. They really, they, they're just perfectly normal human beings, but they're just engaging in the, the sin of interest. So I'm not sure how this can be related to the dunya. I can't really see that in front of me, to be honest with you. So here the ayah, uh, as I quoted from At-Tabari, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, يَتَخَبَّلُهُ الشَّيْطَانُ فِي الدُّنْيَا The shaitan, the insanity from the shaitan is something that happens in the dunya. Hmm. But this punishment for the people of riba is Yawm al okay. And he quoted from Ibn Abbas. So the ayah is split over two things. Mm -hmm. The punishment which takes place for the for akil al-riba, the one who devours riba, Yawm al okay. is a punishment which is comparable to the tahabbul of the khabbul of the shaitan, the insanity caused by the shaitan in the dunya. That's what At-Tabari said. Rahimullah ta'ala. And he quoted that from Ibn Abbas, from Qatada, that, the Qat that this is referring to the dunya in terms of the shaitan and the possession, but the akhirah in terms of the punishment for akil al-riba. So it's, it's not a direct proof in and of itself. It's more the speech of men who have said that this particular ayah, which is talking about the hereafter, because the ayah is quite clear that this takes place in the hereafter, it's referring to a, something that happens in the dunya. This is really kind of what the the Mufassirin are saying uh, about this particular ayah. No, the ayah Do you have like a direct proof in the Quran? The ayah itself is clear in that way. That's why the Sheikh said that the Mufassirin, not one of them have understood it to be anything else. That's what it is. That's what the ayah means. So the ayah is talking about the Yawm al The, the ayah is saying, the first portion of the ayah is saying, riba. Those who are eating the riba, la yaqumuna, they don't stand at the day of judgment. Okay. Except the way that the one who, when he's possessed, is unable to stand because of having like a seizure. Uh, it's the same way that it's going to be for the one who eats riba the day of judgment. So the people in this world, they see that when a person is possessed the way he is, mm. the comparison here is is of that for the way it's going to be for the one who eats riba. So we can't, the punishment for the one who's eating riba now, mm -hmm. we haven't seen it. That's going to be the day of judgment. Okay. But what we do see, the ayah is telling us, is what you guys see in this world, the way that when a jinn enters a person's body, because the word messi is used, which is the touching of the shaitan, mm. or the entering or the possession of the shaitan to the person. This is the tashbih, the mushabbah, and the mushabbahu bihi that's been used in the ayah. Do, do you have any uh, additional proofs in the Quran that maybe... Because for me, that I'll be honest with you, it still seems and appears like that's something that takes place in the mm. akhirah, and the, uh, on the day of judgment, this this possession that takes place on day of judgment, and the comparison to the dunya is obviously what the opinions of the mufassirin have brought forward. But it doesn't really clearly mention that this, like in in those words, that this takes place in the dunya. I think, I think first of all, just to go back a second, I should I really want to just emphasize once again that. Imam Al-Tabari, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, It wasn't, I didn't put that in. Yeah, Imam no doubt, Al-Tabari, 310 thing. years after the Hijrah, quoting from the likes of Ibn Abbas, from Qatada, from the great scholars of Tafsir, and he doesn't find anyone had an opinion other than that, to the point that Ibn Juzay Al-Kalbi, in a tasheel he says, Ajma' al-Mufassirun. The scholars of Tafsir, they have consensus on this issue. And likewise, not only that, but there are others who narrated the consensus or narrated a similar opinion al Muhardi al Baghawi, Ibn al Jawzi, al Qurtubi, Abu uh, Hayyan, Ibn Kathir, al Lusi, Ibn Ashur. All of them said the exact same thing. So, this is really the way we understand this ayah. The language is clear. This is something which is 
very, very clear in the Arabic language. It's very clear that it's referring to the junoon, the insanity, which comes from, and the sara, the, 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 the effects like fainting and so on, that come from okay. jinn possession. This is the opinion of all of the scholars of tafsir. There isn't anyone who said anything different. But we do have other ayat from the Qur'an which support this and indicate this. And from them, one of the ones that is mentioned within some of the books of tafsir in, in the Ayan Surah Al-Baqarah, that some of them referred, and among them Ibn Kathir, who referred to the ayah in Surah Al-A'raf, at the end of Surah Al-A'raf, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْا إِذَا مَسَّهُمْ طَائِفٌ مِّنَ الشَّيْطَانِ تَذَكَّرُوا فَإِذَا هُمْ مُبْصِرُونَ Those people of taqwa, when they are touched by a ta'if from the shaytan. Mm. Now I'm going to quote what Ibn Kathir said about this word. They remember. تَذَكَّرُوا Either they remember Allah or they remember that this is from the shaytan. فَإِذَا هُمْ مُبْصِرُونَ Then they can see clearly. Ibn Kathir, he said regarding this, وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ فَسَّرَ ذَلِكَ بِالْغَضَبُ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ فَسَّرَهُ بِمَسِّ الشَّيْطَانِ بِالصَّرْعِ وَنَحْوِ He said, some of them translated this ta'if that it's the anger caused by the shaytan and others said that it is the touch of the shaytan that causes epilepsy and the likes of it. We've already quoted from Surah Al-Jinn, وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ رِجَالٌ مِنَ الْإِنسِ يَعُوذُونَ بِالْرِجَالٍ مِنَ الْجِنِّ And that Ikrima said about them that they cause that he, uh, as we said uh, from the quote of Ikhra, فَأَصَابُوهُمْ بِالْخَبْرِ وَالْجُنُونَ hmm. They caused them to become insane. Uh, and likewise, we can add also to that in Surah Al-Mu'minun, وَقُلْ رَبِّ أَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ هَمَزَاتِ الشَّيَاطِينَ وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ رَبِّ أَنْ يَحْضُرُونَ Al-Raghib al-Asfahani said regarding this, that uh, the hamazat from the hams, it means to put, to put pressure and to strangle. Okay. So also we have any in this, uh, and likewise, uh, we have also the uh, Ibn, uh, Ibn Jarir narrates from Abdurrahman bin Zayd bin Aslam that he said about Hamazat al Shayateen that it's when the Shaytan, yani, khanaqahum bin nas, when the Shaytan strangles and puts pressure upon the person. So these are all ayat which indicate or which have some of the scholars of tafsir mm-hmm. said about them that they indicate this. Even if the eye in Surah al Baqarah is as clear as. Like mm. the sun in the middle of the day. But these ayat also provide additional support to that concept. Did you have any other ayat or any other points to add to that? Um, the Sheikh mentioned um, th- that ayat and many, yeah. there's many more ayat that, that can be used. I, th- I think, um, so what I'm getting so far, I think it's great that, um, you know, there are certain ayat in the Quran that have certainly been interpreted by great men. Great men they were um, to mean this, that the, p- the possession takes place. On, in the dunya but I think what's difficult for me is that regardless of the interpretation of men there's almost a clear-cut verse from Allah from the speech of Allah himself that almost refutes this concept in totality and that is the, the ayah in Surah Ibrahim ayah number 22 where Allah is talking about the, the day judgment when everything all the affairs have been decided and shaitan clearly says to the people وَمَا كَانَ لِيَا عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانٍ إِلَّا أَنْ دَعَوْتُكُمْ فَاسْتَجِبْتُمْ لِي فَاسْتَجِبْتُمْ فَاسْتَجِبْتُمْ لِي I had no authority over you except, so I had no authority over you, none whatsoever, ex- and shaitan is a jinn, like we mentioned, except that I invited you and you responded to me. Mm. Does this ayah not indicate that the maximum of shaitan's powers, and therefore any jinn's powers, is to whisper to us, is to invite us? Mm. Shaykh, do you want to start with this one? Do you want me to start? No, no, no. You to start, and then I'm going to. No, no, I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can say later. Fadal. I'm going to start with an I'm going to start with an example here because I'm trying to understand what it is what it is what the point is that you're trying to bring across okay. right here. We're going to take someone just for the purpose of this conversation. The jinn possession exists, and a person becomes possessed by the shaitan. That person is going to be in one of two cases: either that person is somewhat in control of their actions to a greater or lesser degree, in which case, yom al qiyamah, they are going to only answer for their actions, right? They're not going to answer for the actions of the shaitan. They're only going to answer for what they answered or what مستجبتم, any, okay. or, إلا أن دعوتكم فاستجبتم لي. Whatever you answered the shaitan or a person answers the shaitan, that's what يوم القيامة you're going to answer for. If the shaitan possesses a person 
and that person reaches the level of insanity, then surely now we have a hadith, the hadith of Aisha, and in some of the hadith of Ali bin Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu, from the Ashab al Sunan, Rufi al Qalam, and Salat, the pen is raised from, thren, from three people, Wa'anin Majnoon, Hatta Yabra, from the insane person until that person regains their sanity. So here I'm not. I'm not really understanding, I'll be honest with you, mm -hmm. where the problem is with this sultan. Because to me, Yawm al Qiyamah, you're only going to be taken to account for the things which were within your responsibility. But that doesn't negate the potential for the shaitan to afflict a person. That was something that just it came to my mind. I don't know if you had. And I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll make one more point okay. only. Because this one also came to my mind. Because this is not the only ayah which mentions that the shaitan doesn't have sultan over uh, the people, over the believers. And in Surah Al-Hijr, Allah Azza wa Jal said, إِنَّ عِبَادِي لَيْسَ لَكَ عَلَيْهِمْ سُلْطَانٍ إِلَّا مَنِ اتَّبَعَكَ مِنَ الْغَاوِينَ And in Surah Al-Nahl, إِنَّمَا سُلْطَانُهُ عَلَى الَّذِينَ يَتَوَلَّوْنَهُ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ بِهِ مُشْرِكُونَ His sultan is only for those people who have taken him as an ally, and those people who have associated him in worship with Allah. Hmm. Uh, here, I, I also want to understand something I didn't understand. Is that if we say that the shaitan doesn't have that sultan, Allah Azza wa in two ayat says that he has sultan. His sultan is over the people who follow him from those who are the misguided and some of the scholars might even expand that to the, the Muslim who is involved in, in the big sins and, and so on. But anyways, mm -hmm. and clearly that the people who take shaitan as an ally and the people who are mushrikun, who have, are polytheists, the shaitan has sultan over them. So now by this principle, should we not therefore say, if we were to follow this principle to its logical conclusion, that the shaitan can possess the disbeliever and the fasiq, but he can't possess the believer? And yet that's also, it, to me, those two points don't, this argument, it doesn't, when you follow it through, it doesn't, it just doesn't stand up. And that's a very strong point, the Sheikh brought, the last point, especially picking on that one. The Sheikh mentioned that the word Sultan, uh, it came as negation and affirmation. So the Qaida is, With two textual evidences, Seemingly, it's contradicting itself mm -hmm. now. Yeah. You brought an eye where it says, "Wa الْأَمْرُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَعَدَكُمْ وَعَدَ الْحَقِّ وَعَدْتُكُمْ فَأَخْلَفْتُكُمْ وَمَا كَانَ لِي عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانٍ إِلَّا أَنْ دَعَوْتُكُمْ فَاسْتَجَبْتُمْ لِي وَفَلَا تَلُومُونِي وَلُومُوا أَنْفُسَكُمْ مَا أَنَا بِمُسْرِقِكُمْ وَمَا أَنْتُمْ بِمُسْرِقِي إِنِّي كَفَرْتُ بِمَا أَشْرَكْتُمُونِي مِنْ قَبْلُ إِنَّ الظَّالِمِينَ لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ. And the Sheikh brought the other ayah, "لَيْسَ لَكَ عَلَيْهِمْ سُلْطَانٌ إِلَّا مَنِ اتَّبَعَكَ مِنَ الْغَاوِينَ إِنَّمَا سُلْطَانُهُ عَلَى الَّذِينَ يَتَوَلَّوْنَهُ." So the shaytan here Allah is saying uh, you have sultan of, over those who follow you mm. and here he said I don't have I never had sultan over you so we have to find a way to reconcile be between these two verses because yes. Allah says do you not ponder over the Quran do you not think and you know contemplate over the Quran and if this the Quran was to come from anyone other than Allah جل, you would have found in it Contradictions. So we know there's no contradiction in the Quran. We need to reconcile between it. The one that Iblis is negating here is the Sultan where he's trying to say, I got to you and I took away from you your whole entire ability. In other words, I took away from you the the ability to think, the ability to choose. Mm. The three that we mentioned for the, for the jinn, Qudra, Irada and Aql. He's trying to say to them, I never stripped you from those three. You had the aql, you could think. Hmm. You also had the ability to choose. Uh, and you also had the cho you know, choice. You, could, you had irada, and you had qudra, and you had aql. That's what Iblis is trying to say that, that you had. So when a person's possessed, and something is said to them, or Quran is recited on them, if you ask them later, did you know what was happening? Generally, they can tell you what took place, what vaguely was happening. It doesn't mean that that person will go and do um, things that they personally don't know what's happening. So, so are we saying it, it can never happen to the point where shaitan can fully. totally take over someone to the point where they lose everything? Or are we saying that if that does happen, they don't actually fall in this ayah mm -hmm. because they're not held accountable for those? That's, I think that is the, 
the safer thing to say. In fact, we can join between the, the two things and say it doesn't really happen. And if it were to happen, if we were to say that it happens, <laughs> and we were to say that the shaitan has takes complete control over the person to the point where they don't know even where they were or what they did, mm. then that person is no different to the person who suffers from certain psychological illnesses in this world that causes them to lose control of what they're doing and the person will not be held accountable for that loss of control. And in fact, in reality, what can we say? Can we not say that they will be held accountable to the extent that they had control? Mm -hmm. That's what's understood by the hadith Rufi al Qalam and Thalath wa anil majnun hatta yabra that the, the person, the pen will be lifted from three until they accept or for the insane person until they regain their sanity. So a person ultimately is only going to be held account Yom al Qiyamah and their paradise or their hellfire is dependent upon their own decisions and choices and not the qahar of the shaitan, that the shaitan literally forced them into things that put them into Jahannam. Okay. Rather, whatever the shaitan forced them into, if he forces them into something by way of possession, they won't be held accountable or they'll only be held accountable to the extent that they followed or listened or cooperated or whatever it may be. Okay. So to me, that, that seems like a very nice way of reconciling it, brings mm -hmm. all of the delil together as well. Okay, I'm not done with you guys yet. So and in the season one, we, on episode five, we talked about the authority of the sunnah and the hadith in the religion. So there is another hadith that I want to bring and mention on this topic, which again appears to me and appears at face value that the restriction applied to the shaitan is waswasa, is basically whispering to the human being. This is his limit. He can't go mm. on further than that. And there's a hadith where a companion came to the Prophet wasallam, and he mentioned that he was having thoughts about Allah that he didn't really want to have. And the Prophet wasallam replied by saying, Alhamdulillah alladhi radda kaydahu ila alwaswasa. He's talking about the, the plan of the shaitan, the plot of the shaitan. And he mentions, praise be to the one who restricted his plot, i.e. the shaitan's plot, to whispering. Again, at face value, it really does seem like the restriction of shaitan's ability is whispering and waswasa. Um, uh, to be very honest, I don't see that having to do anything with the, the issue of possession and uh, the evidence for that is that that man's situation could have been just mere waswasa and not being possessed by shaitan. It doesn't show that that's... Is it not a general statement? No. Alhamdulillah alladhi radda kaydahu. Mm. So the one that Allah has restricted, he didn't say, it seems like a general statement, is it not? No, it means Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, the shaytan, the, what a shaytan has whispered to you and what he has told you, alhamdulillah, that Allah tabarak wa ta'ala brought back his plan and plots against him. That's what the hadith mentions. It doesn't say that this is all that shaytan can do or this is the ability that he has. I mean, that's qiyasun ma'al fariq. Like, I don't see how that's related to what we're talking about mm. here. But while you're on the topic of hadith, I think, yeah. I think that... When we look at other ahadith, this becomes extremely clear. And indeed, there are probably too many ahadith to even mention in, in this podcast from the huge number of ahadith. But I'm just going to start. I'm going I'm to put one in there just to get us going, inshallah okay. ta'ala. So we'll start with the hadith which is narrated from Ata bin Rabah from uh, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah regarding the woman she was known as Umm Zufar, if I'm not mistaken. And she was a woman who she suffered from epilepsy. She said to the Prophet, inni wa inni ata li. So I have epileptic fits and I become unclothed. So make dua for me. And the Prophet said to her that if you wish, you can be patient and you'll have Jannah. And if you wish, I will ask Allah to uh, cure you. And she said, Asbir, I will be patient. In a narration narrated at this hadith, the hadith, the asr of the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, but this, there's a narration from a bazaar, which is also from Ibn Abbas, of the same hadith, mm. in which she said, Inni akhafu al-khabith an yujarridani. I am scared that this filthy soul, this filthy thing, mm. Al-Khabith, and Al-Hafid ibn Hajar, he says here, Al-Khabith huwa shaytan. The Khabith is the shaytan. is going to make me unclothed. And then Al-Hafid ibn Hajar said, after this commenting on this, he said uh, here, 
كان بأم زفر يعني or he said الذي كان بأم زفر كان من صرع الجن لا من صرع الخلق he said this that was afflicting Um Zufar, it was from the jinn and not from, or it appears it was from the jinn and it was not from the normal sort of bodily functions that caused it. And this is in Fath al-Bari. Mm. So here, this is just one hadith and the hadith is very well known of a woman who had epileptic fits and she, it appears that her fits were being caused by the jinn. So I, mean, I want to mention something. Half the Muhajir is saying saying that the uh, word khabith hmm. is a jinn is actually taken from the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-khubthi hmm. wal khabait so it's not just the qawl of Ibn Hajar okay. so just so we it's know that uh, that's his delil well, that's what I, 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 do want, I, would, I do also want to, want to ask you a question because Ustad Tim is born in a narration of a very, very well-known hadith and one of the reasons it's very well-known is because it's in Bukhari and Muslim yet you have to go to another source outside of that to prove your point and you can't bring it from Bukhari Muslim because neither of them mentioned this particular word in that you want to prove your point. Did they forget it? Did they get it wrong? Well, why is that? First of all, we have to understand is Sani'atul Imam al-Bukhari. Imam al-Bukhari as an individual, we have to understand his methodology and his way. Bukhari didn't condition in any way, shape or form that he's going to bring all of the authentic hadiths in his sahih. Okay. He didn't say, I'm going to uh, take a hadith which are sahih and place it. In, I'm going to take all the hadiths sorry, which are sahih out there and I'm going to write in my book, and anything outside my book is, is, uh, is, is weak. No, he didn't say that. Rather, he himself authenticated a hadith hmm. that are not in his sahih. But he bought this one in his book. He just didn't bring this additional word. So in what we say is, first of all, we have to understand Bukhari. Hmm. But, you know, he is the first, he is the first person, they say, who conditioned authenticity. That he said, oh, my book is going to be the most, you know, all the hadiths and everything in there is going to be authentic. That's why the... Iraqi mentions in his Alfiya, thousand lines, he says, Bukhari conditioned in his Sahih authenticity. And then he said, And some people, they gave virtue to Muslim who came after than Bukhari, but the scholars reconciled between that and they said that Bukhari is better than Muslim in terms of Bukhari is better in terms of authenticity. He's and Muslim is better in terms of how he structured his book. Okay. But Bukhari never said that I'm going to bring all of the hadith which are sahih yeah. because Iraq even states that and everyone has stated that. Yeah. And I just, just said uh, as I just said to you, Bukhari himself, Rahimahullah, authenticated many a hadith which are not in his sahih. And he said these are hadith which are sahih. But there was a w- thing that he wanted. He wanted specific, specific narrations, specific uh, shara'it and conditions that he wanted to see in his sahih. And that's something long for us to go into right now. Sure. What are his conditions and why he conditioned this and everything. But to think and to assume and to say that Bukhari avoided it so there is something in it is not, there is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an incorrect premise. And if I, if I add a hadith which is in Sahih Muslim. Okay, cool. Uh, من حديث أبي سعيد الخدري that he said that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said إذا تتأب أحدكم فليم فليمسك بيده على فيه فإن الشيطان يدخل the hadith mentions إذا تتأب أحدكم that if one of you yawns hmm. uh, فليمسك بيده على فيه place your hand over your mouth فإن الشيطان يدخل شيطان أنتز hmm. حديث صحيح مسلم the hadith is in Hadith Abi Sa'id al Khudri. It's a hadith you can say that it's written in, you know, one of the two Sahih books. It's not. It's not just using hyperbolized speech to emphasize the importance of covering your mouth. I mean, I, I've honestly I've seen people who yawn without covering their mouth, and I've never seen anybody become immediately possessed by the jinn or anything like this. So Adam al Ilmi la yadullu ala Adam al Wujud. Like just because you don't know doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Number one. Number two. Um, it doesn't mean that every single person who yawns who doesn't put his hand over his mouth that the shaitan will enter. Do you know one person it's happened to? Um, I mean, it could be a lot of people I know that are possessed and this is where the possession started from. It could be. You see, it doesn't have to be it happens to everybody. The hadith didn't say it's going to happen to everybody. It's enough that it happens to one person. Mm. I mean, uh, just as a side benefit regarding the same issue. Allah said in the Quran in a lot of places He said, Inna Allah, la hadil Allah does not guide the, uh, the uh, valimin, the wrongdoers. Now you might say to yourself, I know a lot of wrongdoers Allah guided. Mm-hmm. 
ان الله لا يهدي القوم الظالمين الله قاعد يهدي الظالم الله قاعد يريكن صادق so this some قول and some of the explanation that scholars give is that Allah doesn't guide the ظالمين doesn't mean all of the ظالمين it means one person if Allah doesn't do it the ayah is, is, is coming to action okay the ayah has been it's done you see like another example like that that scholars bring is that for example when they define the term wajib they say ma yuthabu ala fi'lihi wa yu'aqabu ala tarki the one who does it will be rewarded for doing the wajib and the one who leaves it will be punished and some of the scholars they said but there, there are some wajibat that the person leaves off and Allah forgives them mm. so how can your definition of a wajib be this mm-hmm. they said is if one person is punished for leaving a wajib it's enough our definition uh, our definition stands understand you see my friend you know, i also uh, thought on a similar talk when we were talking about the shaitan entering what about the hadith regarding the shaitan s- when the person goes to sleep mm-hmm. in the nose of the person mm-hmm. and he lives in the nose yeah and that, that so this is uh, and just to that just came to my mind right now i was just mm. thinking I, I had written a note on it before but it just came and that's also another similar kind of narration it's a very well known narration regarding the shaitan uh, when a person sleeps the shaitan s- sleeps or the shaitan spends the, the night in his yeah in his nose right what about the famous hadith of uthman al hadith al uthman ibn as uthman ibn al as yeah ibn as which one is it which is ibn majah it's on ibn majah where the Prophet ﷺ said, "Ukhrija adu Allah," you know, come out. The enemy is Allah. Are there not other narrations of the same hadith where this wording isn't mentioned again? Um, now this one's authentic and it's sahih. And some yeah. scholars they try to weaken it because of the disconnection between Al Minhari and Amrin, who they said that he didn't hear from uh, Ya'la ibn Murrah. Hmm. Hmm. Um, that's the hadith of Ya'la ibn Murrah mm. So that's the hadith Sorry, that's the hadith of Ya'la mm. ibn Murrah hey, That one we're going to come to as well We're going to no. bring that one in as well Even that hadith is Some scholars try, Yeah, the hadith of uh, Uthman ibn As mm. Is different from the hadith of Ya'la ibn Murrah Sorry The hadith of Ya'la ibn Murrah um, Some scholars they try to weaken it And say that Al-Hakim narrated in his Mustadrak And many other scholars narrated it mm. They said that the hadith of Al-Minhar ibn Amrin They said it's weak mm. Yahya ibn Qatan said Yahya ibn Sa'id Qatan said Al-Minhar ibn Amr he's, he's a weak person That's one call that said Second is that He hasn't heard from Ya'la ibn Murrah But we can avoid all of that By having a chain That fulfills that Who People have narrated from Ya'la, Ya'la ibn Murrah Other than Al-Minhar ibn Amr Such as um, So what is this hadith First of all This hadith that you're mentioning What is this So we have We, we, we mentioned just two right now right? Yeah. So we mentioned the hadith of Uthman ibn al-As Let's just Bring that one out the way okay. that he said, "Arad al shayfi salati or fi salawati." He said that something appeared to me in my prayers, hatta ma adri ma usalli, to the point that I didn't know I was praying. Okay. He he came to the messenger of Allah. He said this to him. He said, "Ya Rasulullah, arad al shayfi salawati hatta la adri ma usalli." Something appeared to me in my salah. I don't know what I'm praying. The Prophet said to him, "Da ka shaytan, dunu, come here." He said he came near to him. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said about him, قال, He struck my chest with his hand. فمي, and he spat into my mouth. وقال, and where is this hadith narrated? This hadith, as we said, is in Ibn Majah. It was declared sahih by Al-Hakim al-Mustadrak, by Al-Busayri. It was declared sahih by Al-Albani. It was declared also sahih by uh, Bashar Awad Ma'roof. All of them declared this hadith in Sunan Ibn Majah. To be sahih This hadith of Uthman ibn al-As Sheikh Osho mentioned the hadith of Ya'la ibn Murrah That a woman she came uh, يعني أن النبي, عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أنه أتته امرأة بابن لها قد أصابه لمم And this word لمم actually I, w- I really want to stop on this Because I came back to this on the dictionary yeah. And the dictionary definition of this is Affliction by the jinn mm-hmm. The Arabs use this word for A child that is a lemma the child that is afflicted by the jinn and taraf min al junun and he was afflicted by insanity that came from the jinn faqala lahu an nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said to this small child or said to the jinn within the child ukhruj adu wallah ana rasulullah qala fa bari he became completely better and so what does that mean ukhruj adu wallah leave or enemy of allah hmm. and i am the messenger of allah and this hadith we say is narrated by ahmad tabarani uh, 
at Tabrizi mentioned it in his uh, Mishkat and he said Sahihun li shawahidi. He said it's authentic because of its shawahid. Uh, Ibn Kathir also said similar. Uh, and also Ibn Kathir said that these chains support each other. فَهَذِهِ طُرُقٌ جَيِّدًا مُتَعَدِّدًا تُفِيدُ غَلَبَةَ الظَّنَّ أَوِ الْقَطْعِ عند المتبحر أن يعلى بن مرة حدث بهذه القصة في الجملة. He said these chains all support each other and they indicate that Ya'la ibn Murra really did tell this story as we see it here for the most part as it is in these, as it is in these narrations. But those who try to weaken it specif- yeah. specifically, mm. uh, there's an imma authenticated it, those who weaken it, they weaken it because of one narrator in the Al-Minhal ibn Amr. Yeah. And Al-Minhal ibn Amr, two problems are in him. Number one is that he is da'if as Yahya bin Sa'id al-Qattan mentioned. And also another thing is he never met Ya'la ibn Murrah. Okay. But we can avoid that in two angles. We can use a mutaba'a and we can also use a shahid. Mutaba'a is that other people have narrated from Ya'la ibn Murrah. The same hadith. The same hadith. Other okay. than Al-Minhar ibn Amr. We can avoid him. From them is Abd, uh, Abdullah ibn Hafsin, Abd, uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Abdul Aziz, and also uh, Umar ibn Abdullah. And Abdul Rahman, uh, so Abdullah ibn Hafsin, Ahmed narrated in his Musnad through that chain. The chain of um, Abdul Rahman ibn Abdul Azizna, Ahmed narrated in his Musnad. Also, the riwaya of uh, uh, Umar ibn Abdi, uh, sorry, uh, Umar ibn Abdullah, Bayhaqi narrated in his Dalail. Now we have a, that's the Mutaba'a. We have a Shahid from Hadith Jabir. Jabir also narrated the same event that Ya'la ibn Murrah narrated. Mm. So we have a Shahid and we have a Mutaba'a. The, the one that's narrated by Jabir, Tabarani narrated in his Awsat. That I can remember for sure. Ahmed, I think he also narrated it. I'm not too sure about Ahmed. Okay. So this is Sahih, that this took place. And it's not the only one. Again, we come again to now we come to the Hadith of Osama bin Zayd. An, when he spoke about going out with the Messenger of Allah وسلم, in the Hajj. And he said, Rasulullah Imra'ah, a woman came to the Messenger of Allah Ma'aha. Laha, she had a child with her uh, and that she said she said by the one who sent you with the truth he is, remains like he's being strangled since the day that I gave birth to him until this time now and that the Prophet then he spat into his mouth then he spat into his Leave your enemy of Allah, I am the messenger of Allah. It's hadith narrated by Al-Bayhaqi in Al-Dala'il, by Abu Nu'aym in Al-Dala'il. Al-Busiri, he brought it in al zawaid And Al-Hafid ibn Hajar, he declared the hadith to be, uh, he, he, he said about this hadith, Isnaduhu Hasan. It is a fair chain of narration. So it's another, yet another hadith of a similar incident which happened with the messenger of Allah, sallallahu okay. alayhi wa sallam. When the sheikh mentions spat, we have to, he doesn't mean that, you know, the prophet, you know, yeah, yeah. he spat like that. It means blowing with a bit of, a Spittle. bit of. Spittle. Like, yeah, Spittle. Yeah. Spittle. But it's different from a nefeth, right? When you, yeah. when you blow like that without the. The nefeth is when you blow and basaka means when you spit only. Hmm. So we have. Actually, we're still, I think we're still going with the hadith. We okay. haven't finished yet. We okay. haven't finished with the hadith. I'm not even going to go to the hadith of Safiya radiallahu anha yet, because we'll come back to that. Or should we b- we'll bring this hadith of okay, Safiya? Why up. not? The hadith of Safiya, radiallahu anha, in which the Prophet said, Inna shaytan yajri min al insani majra dam. The shaytan, he flows through the person in the, the way that the blood flows or the place that the blood flows. And this was used as an evidence for jinn possession by al Qurtubi and Ibn Hajar al Haytami and al Bukhari and Ibn Hajar al Asqalani. Uh, and uh, 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 and Muwaffaq uh, al-Din uh, Abdul Latif al-Baghdadi and Al-Qasim in his tafsir and Al-Nawawi mentioned it from some of the shafi'i I think it was Al-Qadi Al-Qadi Iyad he mentioned it from that this hadith is it refers to something real yani that the shaitan really truly flows through a person the places that the blood the blood but flows but the, through the, the, is the contents of this hadith when the Prophet was walking with his wife Mm. And a group, so it came across a group of companions, and to clarify to them that this was his wife, he mentioned this. Is that not to do more mm. with suspicion? The companions weren't like having epileptic fits at the time. No doubt, them. that's the, the the story of the hadith is like that, but that's not what all those scholars that I quoted to you all use this hadith 
as an evidence for jinn possession. And we quote also, you can quote from Surah An-Nas, nas He whispers into the hearts of men. There are mm. so many narrations that mention like this that use words indicating that the whispering of the shaitan, the touch of the shaitan is something which exists externally and it exists within a person as well. Do you agree, Shia? Sorry, it does. Uh, so, sorry, just, just to clarify, if I whisper something into your ear, I'm not inside your ear, mm. I'm outside. But that's why the ayah doesn't say, الَّذِي يُوَسْوِسُ فِي أَذَانِ النَّاسِ In the ears yeah. of the people. No, of course, but if, if shaitan obviously doesn't have to whisper into our ears, he can whisper into our hearts. Because he's, mean, because he, <laughs> because it doesn't mean he's in our body. That's why he's going into someone's but, heart. I tell you, well, does shaitan need to be close to us to whisper into our ears, or can he whisper from far? So that's the, your your uh, your usage of the ayah is an ayah which is am is a general word verse. It means whisper externally and also internally. Okay, so why, why are you why are you restricting the meaning into one of those? Well, I I would say why are you adding the internal? Because it falls under the t meaning. You west whistle. He does was Yeah. With all the hadiths we mentioned, the was is two is those two forms. He does it externally, and he does it internally. We, we, we have both of those. The ayah can take both the meanings. Why have you chosen one and eliminated the I'll other? I'll tell you why. Because if shaitan was able to possess us, it would be one of his greatest powers over us. It would be a huge power. And the context of this ayah in Surah An-Nas is we're seeking refuge from Allah from this. So we're actually seeking refuge from the whispering of shaitan. Why didn't Allah just ask us to seek refuge from the possession of shaitan, the mess? Okay, I have a question. Make it simple. Don't you think that the shaitan whispering into you and shaitan whispering to you from outside, both of them are the same effect in the sense where both times he's convincing you what he wants? No? I think one, the whispering, remember the word whispering, I'm, I'm talking about the English mm. language anyway. Mm. Whispering is someone trying to influence someone with their words. Possession is a whole new topic. You're taking over my, you're taking certain, to a certain extent, you're taking control of my body. You're making me do things that I didn't want to do. Whispering does not have that connotation at all. You don't I agree? I, I, don't, I don't know. I just, I think Sheikh can explain, expand on it a bit more. But I think some people have the idea that possession is a person who's majnoon, fully majnoon. Mm. It's crazy. Like he doesn't know what's happening. And he's. I think yeah, the right word to use here is people have the idea that there are no shades of gray within possession. Maybe that's the right way to say it. Like people understand it's either zero control or it's either 100% control. Well, it's not, there is no evidence and that if one of the strongest evidences against that is the hadith of Uthman ibn al-As when he said that something appeared awdali shayfi salawati something appeared for me in salawat did mm. he say that I became majnoon I don't know where I, I am and I'm all day I'm just walking like a zombie he said during my prayers something happens where I become confused about how much I prayed so like a whisper to confuse him maybe it could be said but that's could be a, exactly and that's why the prophet said akhruj ya'du wallah Leave or enemy of Allah. So this is something that, to me, the fact that the shaitan is within and without is something which is mentioned repeatedly in different ways w within the Quran and the Sunnah, one of which is nas. But I was still, I hadn't finished with my hadith. I was still going. I still had, I still had a hadith that I wanted to raise with you. I wanted to raise with you the hadith of Abil Aswad al-Sulami radiallahu anhu in which the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he mentioned a dua that he used to say. And he mentioned he used to say, وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ أَنْ يَتَخَبَّطَنِ الشَّيْطَانِ عِنْدَ الْمَوْتِ Which means? I seek refuge with you. I'm, the same, يَتَخَبَّطَنِ الشَّيْطَانِ مِنَ الْمَسِ The same that is mentioned mm. in the ayah, that the shaytan afflicts me at the time of death. Mm. I'm, I still understand, because we still had يَتَخَبَّطَنِ is something imaginary, it doesn't really exist. So now we have the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam making dua for Allah to protect him from something imaginary, or maybe not. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, doesn't also really make sense either. Uh, this hadith narrated by Ahmed Abu Dawood and Nasai, Al-Hakim declared it to be Sahih, Al-Zahabi agreed with him, Sheikh Nasir agreed with him, Abdul Qadir Al-Arnaut said it's Nadu Hassan. And, and, and the word affliction here is not a general in the sense of being influenced, because in the ayah it mentions mess it's with it's affliction. The, here the same, the, but in the ayah it mentions as al tabari said, yeah. min al causes him to suffer insanity. Mm. The shay shaitan causes me to suffer insanity. It's not really waswasa, is it? Can so it happen to waswasa? Bit, bit, bit level, uh, it's a bit level above waswasa here, you know. Shaitan 
is a level which is above the level of al waswas And again, we still, you know, we're talking about uh, the hadith narrated by Ahmed, al Tirmidhi, Abu Dawud, and Nasai, from Abi Sa'id al Khudri, that the Prophet said, A'udhu billahi samir ali min ash-shaytani rajim min hamzihi wa nafkhi wa nafthi. And okay. here, again, uh, in Lisan al Arab, that what it mentions here is regarding uh, al Hams here, uh, it mentions something which is said about it Jinsun min al Jununi wa Sara. It's a kind of insanity and a kind of uh, like epilepsy or yani epilepsy or fainting. So we say we have, mm. like, this is really, this is something very, very well established in the Sunnah. Okay, if that's the case, if it's so clear cut, so easy for us to understand like that, why have there been great scholars who have denied this? For example, Ibn Hazm said, to claim that shaitan can possess people and take mm. control of them is to speak without knowledge and this is haram. This issue can only be known through a sound report and we don't have any sound report from the Prophet ﷺ in this mm. regard. Fakhruddin al-Razi said in his tafsir, shaitan has no power whatsoever to cause people to fall into illness or pain. Mm. It's funny you say that, but I actually have a quote from Ibn Hazm. And this quote uh, in which Ibn Hazm, he said it in uh, Al-Fasl fil Milal wal Ahwai wal Nihal. He said here, and he, he said, فَذَكَرَ عَزَّ وَجَلْ تَأْثِيرَ الشَّيْطَانِ فِي الْمَسْرُوعِ Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned that the shaitan has an effect on the person suffering epilepsy. فَصَحَّ أَنَّ الشَّيْطَانِ يَمَسَّ الْإِنسَانِ الَّذِي يُسَلِّطُهُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ مَسَّنْ كَمَا جَاءَ فِي الْقُرْآنِ So it is authentic that the shaitan touches a person from the way that Allah has given them authority to do so with a mess that is mentioned in the Qur'an. And that's a, that's a quote from Ibn Hazm straight out there, it's still going from Ibn Hazm. He mentioned that Allah Azza wa causes as-sara, the, the jinn to cause, he allows the jinn to cause epilepsy or taqabbut for the person to become insane. At this moment, the same way that we witness with our own eyes. Ibn Hazm is talking about how he witnesses it with his own eyes. He said, وَهَذَا هُوَ نَصُّ الْقُرْآنِ This is the text of the Qur'an. وَمَا تُوجِبُهُ الْمُشَاهَدَةَ And that which we see with our own eyes. وَمَا زَادَ عَلَى هَذَا فَخُرَفَاتِ He said, whatever is extra to this, whatever people say extra to this, this is, this is uh, you know, innovations and, and statements that have no basis. Ustad Khan, how do we understand this? We've got two almost conflicting quotes from the same person. Ibn Hazm, rahimahullah, um, even though that we love him and we respect him as a sheikh and an imam, um, like in, he, they say that he had a lot of um, uh, mistakes, in, especially when it came to issues of hadith um, and even in aqidah. They say in Babel Asma' wa Sifat, he's a Jahmi, mm. Ibn Hazm. And in hadith, he's is also a person who uh, criticized, for example, Imam Tirmidhi, rahimahullah. And he said that Imam Tirmidhi is someone who's not known. And Tirmidhi is what? From one of the six books of hadith. Mm. So he has shudud like this, things which are strange and awkward that he might sometimes say like that. Uh, and a lot of the times you find contradicting statements of his, yeah. where he affirms and he negates things. Uh, was it a phase he went through? Was it something he, that became clear to them? I mean, it's one of the funny things that the scholars mention is that Ibn Hazm, they say he never done hajj in his life. He never, he never done hajj. Even though he's from a very rich family, one of the people was very rich. He was uh, father was a minister, so he was rich. And the, 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 the refutation that used to take place between him and Abu Walid al-Baji, they used to go back at each other. One of the things that they said to each other was, Abu Walid al-Baji said to him, you know, avo- you know, f- excuse me, but I'm a person who ha- who learnt under the, the the candle. I had to re- write f- under the candle. I didn't have nothing. And Ibn Hazm said, well, you also, excuse me, I learned under pearls and jewels <laughs> and... <laughs> So they said he wrote a kitab called Al Hajjat al Wada, where he talked about how to do Hajj. And they said, fi mi'ata mas'ala. Wow. He did a hundred mistakes. Lam yahuj. They said because he didn't do Hajj himself. So he was talking about theoretically, he didn't, he didn't go there to see it and do it himself. Hal, Ibn Hazm, rahimahullah, these things and other things like that. Babul Asma'i was Sifat, Allah's names and attributes. They said he's a Jahmi. Jahmiya. Like dangerous in, in his birth. So he has Shawad and. Uh, sometimes like these issues which especially when issues are ijma' sometimes it just goes after ijma' لذلك there's a risala written هل الظاهرية هل الظاهرية هذا ظاهرية يعتد في الاجماع 
لما يعتدوا في الخلاف the ظاهريه are the خلاف taken into consideration when there is an ijma for example we have an ijma the ظاهريه say something ظاهريه is the belief that he's of the fun he took from Abu Dawood al-Zahiri is their khilaf taken into consideration once we've had a consensus and in an, an issue do we give any weight to the ظاهريه there's a, there's a discussion going on in that regard so here we say we have consensus of great noble imams we have ijma in terms of tafsir of the ayah alladhina yaquluna riba la yaquluna illa kama yaqumu alladhi yataqabbatu shaytan min al-mas the ayah is ijma I have no other interpretation of that ayah and um, that's important you mentioned fakhruddin al-razi also in there as well um, and mom walad imam tahawi the people have only been commanded to seek refuge from the whispers of shaytan this is the only power that shaytan has I mean, doesn't this break the ijma' that you're talking about? Well, what did he say? Mention Fakhruddin Razi. What did he say? Fakhruddin Razi says Shaytan has no power whatsoever to cause people to fall into illness or pain. If he has no power to do that, then how can he possess something? So, I mean, again, we have to that we we're gonna get things wrong if we don't go if we don't take this approach. The qaida is kalam al ulama yuhtajju laha wa la yuhtajju biha. I'd say the same thing to you. Sorry, just explain that in English. The statements of the scholars they need evidences. Yeah, they're not used as evidences. I'm not saying to you this is the speech of, you know, all the other ayats that we brought from the Quran, they were interpretations. And I'm yeah. like, we said it's a consensus. A consensus of people, of scholars. No, we, consensus is a proof now. Okay. It's a proof like the Quran and the Sunnah is a proof. And what was the evidence for that consensus is a proof? I know it's a slight tangent, but how can you say that? Allah says, Allah says, anyone who diverts from the path of Allah and the Messenger and the path of the believers. The path of the believers means the consensus of the Muslim. Okay. And then Allah says, Allah said in another ayah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, he said, Ya Allah wa ati'u Allah wa ati'u Allah wa ati'u Rasoola wa ulil amri minkum. Fa in tanazatum fi shayin, farudduhu ila Allah wa al-Rasool in kuntum tu'minuna billah wa liyawmin akhir, dalika khayru wa ahsanu ta'wila. Allah says, if you differ in something, hmm. bring it back to the Quran and the Sunnah. The mafhum al-mukhalafa, which is the reverse understanding of it, is that if we do not differ, we don't bring it back to the Quran and the Sunnah. I mean, there's a consensus. Okay. So the consensus is a hujjah. There's a hadith narrated by Hadith Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, Tirmidhi narrated in his Sunan, and the Tirmidhi narrated in his Jami'ah, and Hadith Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala, and Huma, where the Prophet said, La tajtabi ummati ala dalala. My ummah do not come together upon this guidance. So the fact that, that all of the, there was a consensus upon the understanding of this ayah in Surah Al Baqarah means we have no choice but to understand it this way. Is that what that's, 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 that's something very important that we that we put that clear. So if Fakhruddin al-Razi say something, if we find, you know, uh, Abu Ali al-Jubba'i uh, saying something which is a Mu'tazili, Abu Bakr al-Razi saying something which they hold that the jinn cannot possess a person, we say to them, you know, the kalam of the consen- of this consensus that we have is going to take precedence mm-hmm. over. And also with Fakhruddin al-Razi, I must admit, I would, I would like to go to go back to that statement. Yes, I, which is because I, I gathered together a long list of, of people who Did went say. against this. And he has a statement saying that the, the, the possession can happen. And he, what I what I saw mm. is the opposite from him. And okay. Also, he's not from the list of well-known people who came out with this. In fact, if we talk about the well-known people who came out with this, they are from three groups only that I have found. And Sheikh, you might be able to find extra. I found primarily the Mu'tazila. And almost everybody who said this was someone who did an explanation or a commentary on al kashaf by Zamakhshi. Almost any, all of the, this is a Mu'tazili thing. By this you're talking about the rejection the of the rejection of, of jinn possession. Jin possession. Okay. Secondly, the second group, the Jahmiyyah. Shaykh Rasam Taymiyyah mentioned, or uh, Ibn Hajar Haytami, some others mentioned regarding the Jahmiyyah. And thirdly, some of the Rafidah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One or two I, I found, not that, yani, to be honest, we have a great deal of concern for that. But they, So, in all honesty, the only people you have who don't say that jinn possess people are the Mu'tazila and the Jahmiyyah and the Rafidah. Mm-hmm. And, so, and a lot of people are watching here right now are going to be like, are the Mu'tazila not Muslims? Who are they? What are they? Are they another be- belief? Are they another, you know, are they a group of Christianity? Mm-hmm. No, the Mu'tazila were a group that came out at the time of Hassan al-Basri, radiya rahimahullahu ta'ala, Hassan al-Basri had a student by the name of Al-Wasil ibn Ata'. Wasil came to Hassan al-Basri and he said something to him regarding the issue of murtakib uh, al-kabira. What is the ruling, I mean, the consequences of the one who does his major sin? 
And then that dialogue between Hassan al-Basri, who's an imam, fi sunnah with this man, al-Wasim al Ata. Hassan al-Basri saw that this man is going through deviation, like he's not going in the right direction. And so what he told him was, he said, I'tazil anna, like get away from us. Mm. So the word Mu'tazila came from there. And then from Wasim al came Amr ibn Ubaid until Ahmad ibn Hanbal's time, Bishr al-Marisi and Tumamat ibn Ashras and Ahmad ibn Du'ad and uh, these, this, this group started to be together and they they evolved their belief. And Bishr al-Marisi and Ahmad ibn Du'ad and Tumamat ibn Ashras and these guys were the ones who imprisoned Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, put him behind bars, especially ibn Du'ad. Ibn Du'ad was very close to al-Ma'mun. He was very close to al-Mu'tasim. He was also very close to al Watiq. These were the three Abbasi leaders. Uh, Harun al Rashid, by the way, got rid of and you know hurt them. You know he, put, he took them all and put them in prison. So they couldn't talk at the time of Harun al Rashid. But Harun al Rashid's uh, brothers, al Watiq, uh, sorry, sorry, al Mu'tasim, who's the brother of Harun al Rashid, he helped them, hmm. and. Uh, uh, not as much as Al-Ma'mun. Ma'mun really helped them, really, really gave them a big, big, big positions. So, for example, Ibn Du'ad became the Al-Qadi uh, Al-Qudat at the time of Al-Ma'mun. And, uh, no, at the time of Al-Wathiq, he became Al-Qadi Al-Qudat at the time of Al-Mu'tasim, which is the Ministry of Justice. So he put Ahmad ibn Hanbal behind prison. Shafi'i refuted him. The point I'm coming to is that this is a deviated group, a corrupt group who believe that the Quran is created. Hmm. Their view and their belief is that the Quran is created. They believe Allah Taala has no characteristics whatsoever, so their belief is corrupt. So, a group like that, evil that way, imprisoned that Imam Muhammad, got him to be beaten in prison. Uh, a group like that, it's not something we want to have their view, and they held this concept, which is taqdimul aql ala naql, which is to give precedence to the reasoning over the revelation. Mm. That's why they, all these unseen. They say we can't internalize it. And that's why we're finding a lot of these current modern du'atun ilallah. They hold the mu'tazili belief. They're really not coming out with anything new. They're just propagating. They're regurgitating what was mentioned by the mu'tazila. And that's interesting, Sheikh, on that point, is that uh, when, we, when you do a summary of the people who held this opinion that the shaitan doesn't possess people, yeah. you see really two groups of people. You see a group of people who really held that belief and they understood it and they held it. Uh, we had uh, mentioned Zamakh Sharim al Kashaf, we had mentioned Juba, uh, you mentioned uh, a couple of others from the Mu'tazila who had this belief. But you see some other people, and what the ulama say about them is they say about them they were from the Shurah and from the people who commented and they made comments on uh, al Kashaf. And all they did is just copy without thinking. Literally just copy the opinions mm. of the Mu'tazila without even reflecting upon them. Now I think this is a good point to talk about ijma because I have some quotes here okay. which are or which indicate that there is consensus from the imma of Islam, from Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah that the jinn enter into the body of Allah. And consensus is an evidence as it's already explained So I'm just going to mention a few And we can start discussing them inshallah We're going to start with Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari uh, Who mentioned them in his book Al-Ibana وَإِنَّ الشَّيْطَانِ يُوَسْوِسُ لِلْإِنسَانِ وَيُشَكِّكُهُ وَيَتَخَبَّطُهُ خِلَافًا لِقَوْلِ الْمُعْتَزِلَةِ وَالْجَهْمِيَّةِ كَمَا قَالَ عَزَّ وَجَلْ Then he mentioned the ayah الَّذِينَ يَأْكُلُونَ الرِّبَا لَا يَقُومُونَ إِلَّا كَمَا يَقُومُ is that the shaitan whispers to the person and causes him doubt and touches him with insanity in opposition to what the Mu'tazila say and the Jahmiyyah say, as Allah Azawajal said, then he quoted the ayah from Surah Al-Baqarah. Keep in mind that now, even this is not a... You have to understand, this khilaf is not between Ahl Sunnah and the Asha'ira as well. The Asha'ira are with us on the issue of jinn possession. So you can see the dispute here of the issue of jinn possession is Ahlu Sunnah on one side and the Mu'tazila and the Jahmiyyah on one side. You take your pick. Which, 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 which group are you going to take? Mm. 